and thank you all the helpers. I want to invite you to stand. I know you haven't stood, but I want you to stand. And I want to encourage you to greet somebody this morning. And I also want to encourage you, if you're out on the far left side or in the back, if you want to move in toward the center, that'd be great. I just want to talk with you a little bit this morning in a kind of a different mode than we normally do. So it's not I'm going to stand up here and preach. I'm going to sit on a a stool. So if you can come closer, I'd appreciate it. If you're going to stay where you are, I'll still love you. You can stay where you are. Uh, But if you can move in, but greet somebody and then move if you can. Look at Rosie and Jason, right? When you read the gospel stories, uh, the other characters play parts, and they're important parts, uh, but the centra- central uh, message is Jesus and who he is and what he came to do. But one of the things that Scripture does encourage us to do is it encourages us to pay attention to the patterns of the way God acts in history. Uh, and matter of fact, if many of you remember Paul when he writes at the beginning of the book of Corinthians, he reflects on the kind of people that God brings to himself. And he says he doesn't, there's not many that are noble, not many that are mighty, not many that are learned. And as has been famously said, I think it was by the Queen of England who said, I'm glad for the letter M, uh, that it said not any uh, noble, but not many. And so God doesn't often work through the powerful and the mighty. He often works through the obscure, the people that the world thinks are insignificant. Uh, Matter of fact, Paul even calls them nothings. The the world would look at them and say, these are nothing people. And I think there's lessons for us from the Christmas story about how God directs his drama of redemption. Uh, And there's lessons for us about the kind of roles that he wants us to play and kind of ways that we should think about ourselves in terms of how we play our roles and what we expect from God. As a matter of fact, one of our church values uh, that we've talked about from time to time reads like this. It says, we believe that leadership, it's under the the context of spirit-led leadership, we believe that leadership must lead the body of Christ by their lives and by their words to perform God's script, to understand, to embody, and to commend by their life and words the transformative work of God in Jesus Christ through the Holy Spirit. One of the ways to look at what God's doing in Scripture is that God, the Father, is the playwright. It's his script. It's his story, right? He's telling his story. A lot of other people are trying to rewrite the script, especially right now in this moment. They're trying to rewrite the script as what it means to be human, what human beings should be doing. No, it's God's story. He writes the script. The master performer that is the goal and the the one that we're all to imitate is Jesus. The Holy Spirit is the one who enables us and directs the performance. He's working among his people for us to embody the character of Christ and follow him. The elders and the pastors in the local church should be assistant directors. Uh, We should be helping the body of Christ perform God's script. The body of Christ is the cast. And you notice here, the body of Christ are not the fans in the stands. They're not the people who are watching the performance. They are the performers. And the stage is the world. So we live out our lives before the world. And we just sang, right, go tell it on a mountain, right? We're called to live for Christ and to represent Christ in the world. Well, I want to draw three lessons from three different individuals about how God directs his story and and the kind of way that he puts the story together. And I want to learn three things. And if you have a pen to write something down, you're going to be hit by one of these categories. And as often, uh, I don't expect you to be hit by everything, but you're going to be hit by something. I can guarantee it uh, in terms of what God has for us here. And I won't read a lot of scripture today because Will helpfully read it all. And so I'm going to refer back to it right as we get there. And Will is serendipitously... um, Uh, unplanned uh, has stepped already into some of the things that I want to say and so he's laid the groundwork for us to do it uh, really well and so I want to I want to stay on top of some of those now first person I want to look at and if you want to write this down this is in Luke chapter 1 beginning in verse 11 this is the story about Zachariah and about God coming to Zachariah and the only thing that I want to point out about Zachariah from the story is in verses 13 and 14, 
where he says this to Zechariah. But the angel said to him, do not be afraid, Zechariah. Your prayer has been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son and you are to call him John. Right Now when we hear that, it's well, okay, so he's a married man and God tells him he's going to have a son. Well, okay, big deal until we learn out that we learn the fact that Zachariah is well past childbearing age and that his wife is uh, on any human calculation, this is nonsense. This is impossible to happen. right? One of the, the phrases in right that occurs in the little story with Mary is that God is the God of the impossible, right? And so here's, here's Zechariah, past the prime, right? He's been faithful to God, serving God all of his life. He's had a deep yearning in his heart, and God knows it, right? The angel comes with a knowledge of what Zechariah and Elizabeth have been calling out for probably ever since they've been married. They've been asking God to give them a child. And for all that time, and well past the time they thought it was even possible, God said, no, not yet. Right? But they, as far as they knew, they, did, they thought it was over, but nonetheless, they're serving God. So here's my first observation about how God directs his play. Right? It's never too late to play your part. That's the first one. It's never too late to play your part. And you're never too old to play your part. It's never too late, and it's never too old. Okay? And I want to reflect on just those two right from Zechariah. Okay, this is a reminder to us. God does not work on our schedule, right? If we'd worked it out, we'd say, well, it's obviously got to happen before Elizabeth becomes infertile, right? It's got to happen. It's got a time frame. God says, no, no, I'm not bound by that time frame. The one who has faith in God increasingly yearns for what God yearns for her. And so ask from God what is in accordance with his will, right? Uh, So what, what I mean by this is we grow and we follow Christ He says there's a lot of things that are blessings, that there's nothing wrong with those things, and we can ask God for that. For some, especially in the college environment, some of them are asking for the kind of life partner they want to walk through life with. Some are asking for a kind of job or a a vocation that's going to be fulfilling for them, right? Um, They're asking for a marriage that's going to be healthy and well. They're asking for um, a God to provide for them uh, an effective life in serving him. And sometimes it seems like God puts us on a shelf. It seems like that the schedule is not being kept the way we want to. But this kind of faith just keeps asking for what is in accordance with God's will. It just keeps asking. It lets God God do it when he wants to. At the same time, though, it keeps serving God. It doesn't give up. It keeps serving God. Uh, Um... I know that it's God's will. I don't know how it's all going to work out, but I know that God's a God that desires all people to be saved. I know as a God that that sent Christ to deliver people. And so no matter how hopeless a son or a daughter seem, or how hopeless a, a, a relative seems or a neighbor seems, the people who believe in God know that it's never too late. It's never too late. It's never impossible. They're never too hard. They're never too far away. They've never gone too far that they can go beyond the reach of God's grace. Never. And so people who believe in God, it's never too late to ask him in accordance with his will for what God wants. So this kind of faith, it trusts God to hear and to respond to what is best for them and the ones they are praying for. God is the God of the impossible, and as long as they are breathing and calling out to God, it's never too late. It's never too late. So that's the first one. Second one, you're never too old, right? You're never too old. And we live in a culture in particular where it used to be in the time of Zechariah and Anna, if you remember her in the temple, where having age was associated with wisdom, with respect, with people who look to you. As a matter of fact, it was associated with God's blessing. That's not true in our culture anymore. Right? You age out of relevance. You age out of importance. Right? Uh, uh, we look to the youth to give us guidance and direction right, in terms of life. The things that are happening below us, right? the, the new, the avant-garde, those are the things that are important. What the older people have to contribute is not much. 
or even a drag on the culture at large. I know I've shared this with you before, but one of my uh, daughters in the faith was talking about she married into a family uh, from, uh, who had people from the Far East uh, in, in their uh, family. And the grandmother came over to visit from her country. And uh, this uh, daughter asked, well, are you going to come over to the United States, assuming that that would be you know, her, her desire to be in the United States? And she said, well, I don't know why I would come to the United States. You guys don't respect your old people. Why would I want to come here and be disrespected? And so the idea here that you can seep into the church itself, that somehow you've aged out of your effectiveness for Christ. Somehow you don't need to serve anymore. Somehow you've done your time. Somehow you get to determine when retirement is. <laughs> Right? I'm retired from service to the Lord. Well, it's never too, you're never too old for God to do something important and dramatic through you. You know, and I've shared this with you before, is one of the things I always appreciated about little Joy Jeffries is she was going to, to go out serving the Lord. And uh, the story about her just over and over again, when she got to a week that she couldn't get up and down with a kindergartner, she said, Greg, I got to step out of here. And then she went to something easier. She went to the Friday Night Alive and started visiting the kids in the detention center, right? Uh, and uh, I remember having, her having that conversation with me saying, Greg, I know they make fun of me, but, but they need love. And then when she got to, to that she couldn't go out on Friday night, she said, well, I'm going to gather a group of women and we're going to have a prayer meeting on Wednesday night. And we're going to pray for the pastors and pray for the church. And I, and I remember that because when she died, she died on a Wednesday night with her prayer list on her side, little um, table right next to her, and God just took her home. And she was never too old. She had never aged out of serving Christ. So Zachariah, right? It's never too late. I don't care what you've done. I don't care how much you've failed. It's never too late to turn to God, repent, and start over. I don't care how old you are. You're not past your usefulness and your importance in the body of Christ. And God forgive us if we ever give that intimation to our own people. Right? The second one then. This one comes from a reflection in Luke chapter 1, verse 26. And this is looking at Mary. Now, it's hard for us to imagine. Mary may have been, estimates probably maybe somewhere in her mid-teens, all right, her mid-teens. Most of us, you know, might look at a, a girl in her mid-teens and wonder if we'd want her to hold our baby, let alone have one, right, um, as we look at that. And so here, here's Mary in her mid-teens, and there's two things I want to say about Mary is in God's direction of his redemptive drama it's never too early it's never too early to play your part right so whether you're tobias's age or whether you're uh, 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 layla's age or freddie's age or judah's age or whatever age you are it's never too early if you be to believe in jesus and it's never too early to serve jesus don't have to wait till you become an adult. We have a group of college-age people who are waiting to adult, and that's their excuse to say, well, I don't have to behave like an adult and take up adult responsibilities. Well, within the body of Christ, we as the followers of Jesus ought to want to serve King Jesus as soon as we're able to our fullest of our capabilities. And so it's never too early. It's never too early if you're a boy in your family to pray for your siblings. It's never too early to obey your parents. It's never too early to have friendships where you're praying for your friends that they might come to know Jesus. It's never too early to come to church and listen when the people that love you, your moms and dads in the faith, are teaching you. It's never too early. Right? And it's never too early. I don't care how young you are in Christ. If you came to Christ yesterday, if you came to Christ, it's never too early to begin serving him. Never. You don't have to wait till you get some particular training. You don't have to wait till some special day. You just need to get busy, right? So it's never too early, and that's from Mary. Mary was, uh, and one of these things is sometimes we think that God brings to us, uh, I was reflecting on this in particular, he brings to us things that we've got to say, God, I, I'm, it's too early for this. I'm not ready to bear this. And let me take you into something that's maybe a little hard or a little dark. God may call us to deal with suffering, even death, 
before we or those around us think it's right that we should have to face something like that. Right? Think about these phrases I've heard many times. This shouldn't happen to children. Or no parent should have to attend their child's funeral. God, the way he directs his drama, sometimes he steps into our lives and gives us heavy things to carry and he says, it's not too early for you to carry this. It's not too early. And because he's good and we know he's a, a God who's, who's saving and reclaiming, we trust him that in the big picture of things, that this makes sense. That God's doing something deep and profound because we know his character because we see it in the baby in the manger. We see it on a cross. We see it in an empty tomb. And because of that, we don't know why, but we trust the one who does know why. Right? Anybody who's lost a loved one to death, it's always too early for them to go. It's always too early. But for God, in his purposes, it's never too early. God may call us to shoulder a responsibility that we think we're not ready to bear. Right? And some of it happens, right, when, when, when there's something that happens in a family, it ripples through the mom and dad, it ripples through the kids, everybody's affected by it, but we have to trust God that it's not too early for them to bear, that God wants to do something deep and profound. That tragedy, that difficulty, that suffering is going to mark you as you turn to Christ and give you a sensitivity and a perspective on life that God's going to use you in a dramatic way. We're trusting him for that, right? So it's never too early. And then secondly, about Mary, you're never too young. Mary may have been in her mid-teens. She was a young girl with little experience of the world and certainly no advanced training for the role she was asked to play. Right? Mary didn't take any parenting classes. She didn't go to anything in terms of that. And God said, okay, Mary, you're highly favored. And God said, I, and Mary, I, I wonder if Mary often thought, God, I'm not so sure this is highly favored. This is really heavy, right? From this point on in Mary's life, her whole life, and you can read about it through the Gospels, she was accused of being a, a, a promiscuous woman. Right? Jesus, when, when, they, when they attacked Jesus, uh, the Jewish authorities, you can read about it in John chapter 8, it says, at least we weren't born from sexual impurities. At least we weren't born from fornication. Well, Mary had that reputation the whole of her life because of the nature of Jesus' birth. That was a heavy responsibility to bear. God may call us to step out courageously to identify with him and speak for him because those who are older or better trained or better equipped are not around or have dropped the ball. Right, some of you, that when you're young, you're going to be at school, nobody else is around. Who's going to represent Jesus if you don't? Some of you are in families that are broken, and you don't have a mom or a dad to look to to tell you how to follow Jesus. You don't have good parenting models in front of you. Well, God's going to say, okay, you're not, you, you're not at a loss. You've got the body of Christ. You've got the spirit of God. You can step up and follow Jesus and love your kids the way. And you can break the legacy that you received from your parents in your life. So you're not too young. It's never too early. Faithfulness to God starts when he rescues you no matter your age, right? You're never too young. It's never too early. Now, the third one then comes from the story about the shepherds. And this is where Will stepped in there. And this is Luke chapter two and verse eight, right? And here uh, it is, it's just one of the marvels of the whole thing. And this is one of the marvels of the whole story is the way God initiates everything, the kind of people that he comes to. And it just reminds us of 1 Corinthians chapter 2. You would think that God would show up in Rome, right? Show up in the forum, make a big display, drop out the heavenly hosts, right? Show everybody and then, then crush everyone underneath the glory of what's going on. Warn the Roman government that your time is up, right? All kind of Jesus would kind of walk in and not come in in a manger in some filthy stall. He'd come in on a white horse to start with, right? So if we, would, if we would be the directors of this drama, that's how we would begin, right? Often in terms of power and might and demonstration. Well, here Jesus comes in an obscure place to an obscure group of people. And of all those people, not only Zechariah, this faithful priest, you know, who's living uh, in, uh, with a nation in exile because of their disobedience. The glory of the Lord is long departed from the temple. He's used to serving in the temple and there's no manifest presence of God because it's long departed. So he's going through this ritual, but he's a faithful follower of Yahweh. 
Here's Mary and Joseph, these two insignificant people that nobody knows about from a place that nobody would want to live in, right? Can any good thing come out of Nazareth, right? Any of those kind of things, and all of a sudden, God breaks in in this moment, and then he comes to this group of people that are literally vagabonds, right? These are, these are people, you can see them today if you go to Israel. They're just traveling around. They're the lowest of the low. Nobody would want to be associated with them, and matter of fact, if you had a party where you wanted to announce something that was really important, you wouldn't say, there are A-listers that we need to bring, right? Just to make the party a little bit more attractive and a little bit more important. They're the last sort of people that anyone would care about. And so I want to say about them two things, right? Two things. Your part that he wants you to play is never too little, right? Sometimes within the world in which we live, uh, we think that we're not significant in God's purposes unless we're up front. Unless God gives us some sort of a voice so that we can, you know, entertain or, or, or carry, you know, the, the crowds on our voice. Or we have uh, rhetorical skills to speak and do those things. Or we have some sort of athletic ability that everyone wants to watch our YouTube clips forever, right? Or we've got some sort of, of skill that we can make, you know, cute little uh, uh, TikTok reels that everybody wants to watch because they're so compelling and interesting. Or we have some sort of thing where we can get a huge following. And matter of fact, you're nothing until lots of people say you're something. And you're thinking, well, what do I have to contribute to what God, I'm, I, what, it's, I just have I'm a bit part. I, don't, I seem like when, when the gifts came along, the skills came along, and God was doling those out, he like he gave me very few. And I just don't seem to matter then maybe my role isn't that insignificant and I, I just need to kind of go in the background and disappear. Well, here's, here's the, the shepherds. God thought they were significant. And you want the role they had to play? This is what's crazy. Just to be witnesses. Just to experience it. He didn't tell them to do anything. They did it because of what happened to them. Well, what was their role? forever. We don't even know their names. God did. All this little obscure group of people, he comes to them. What's their role? They get to see the angelic hosts. They get to experience the glory of God. They get to have this announced. That's it. Okay. They didn't rule any people. They didn't have any great singing skills. They didn't have an ability to write so that everyone wanted to read what they wrote. All they did was glory at God's glory and then talk about it. And, and for us, your part of the experience to have God bless you by rescuing you is an experience that you should never get over. And if your part is always just to say, God did something for me, I got to tell you about it. That's a worthy life. That's worth spending your life on. Long time ago as a professor, I have students that come to me and I always, initially when I first started, I was so panicked about giving them the right answer because I wanted to give them the right answer. I wanted to help them, especially if they were struggling. And I just was thinking through it often, get very nervous. I'd pray before they would come because these were weighty conversations for me. But then I realized, you know, that I don't have all the answers. I don't have all the answers. But one thing I do have is I know Jesus. On your knees and ask God to let you see the power of Christ anew and afresh so that you get overawed by it. Right? And then the last one here, you're never too insignificant, right? Your part's never too little and you're never too insignificant. And here I'm not talking about your part so much as that the fact that um, we think we have to have certain credentials or certain uh, abilities to play a role and we think that we're insignificant and all I want to say is that God doesn't have any insignificant people. We're all insignificant compared to God, right? We, we, we develop this little criteria where we elevate each other over each other, but as far as God is concerned, we're all, right? rebels who've turned from him the only reason we have significance is because he says i love him i love her he gives us that they mattered to god and he had suited them right do you believe this or we're going to read this a little bit later 
God has suited each one of us to play our own role. Play our own role. Some of us may have many people who know us and speak about the impact that we've had. Some of us, it may be one. Some of us, the impact of our life may not occur until after we die. We may not even know it. And we live a life of faithfulness. And the testimony of our life ripples through the lives of other people that we do not know. The way you go about your daily activities with the people in your life is leaving an aroma. Whoever it is, right? You're never too insignificant. The evil one wants to tell you your part doesn't matter. And the evil one wants to tell you you don't have the right credentials. So shut up, sit back. So let me draw these threads together. All right, and I'll remind you of these. The good news, the gospel, reveals the drama that God is directing. It has a beginning in creation in the fall. That's where Will took us as the beginning. A climax in the work of Jesus. Right, that's the center point, right? The hopes and fears of all the years are met in thee tonight. It's right to the center point. Everyone in the Old Testament they believed in the promise, but if the promise was not fulfilled in Jesus, their belief would be in vain. So when Jesus died, Abraham's faith became saving faith, right? And since that time, we all believe on Jesus and anticipate his future return. And it has a resolution. This story will be resolved one day, right? We won't need a blue Christmas, right? Some of you went to blue Christmas, right? as a time of grieving because the holidays not only deep in joys, but they deep in grief. The absences are more powerful, right? But one day it's going to have a resolution in a future judgment where, where justice will be done and in a new creation where all things will be made well, right? It tells about God the Father has done, tells about what he's done, what he is doing, what he will do through the work of Christ by the power of the Spirit to restore and reclaim everything. The drama involves calling out a people of his very own to bless them and through them to bring blessing to one another in the world, right? That's what God's doing. He's calling out, he's called out people in this room to him. And, and one of the things he wants to do is he wants to bless you and he wants to make you a blessing, right? And so within his people, God has a role for each of them to play, something they are uniquely created and shaped by life's experiences to perform, right? God does not waste pain. He does not waste joy. He do does not waste a dysfunctional family. God doesn't waste those things. He's uniquely, providentially ordered your life to give you sensitivities and perspectives that I don't have, and they're going to make you uniquely ready and appropriate and suited to tell the good news to someone else who thinks that their life is too broken or hopeless. And you're going to testify to the life of Jesus that he saved me out of that. God's at work in that. So here's the snapshot that we looked at today. It's never too late to play our part, and we're never too old. It's never too early to play our part, and we're never too young. Our part is never too little, and we're never too insignificant to play our part. So let me ask us some questions. Have you given up? Have you given up? Do you think you're past your prime, that it's too late, that you can't recoup your life, that you can't follow the Lord? Right, talking recently with one of our relatives this person made the statement, it just seems too late. He said, no, 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 it's not too late. Every day is a day to begin right, a new life that will affect you for eternity. Every day is a day to put down an old habit that is, is enslaving you and turn your heart to Christ and let him bring you alive. Every day, it's never. Have you retired? If you're an older person here, have you retired? Have you said, I did my time? 
right? Kids are too much of a pain, right? I don't want to get messed in, in church, you know, relationships anymore. I've been through that before, and I've been beat up by people. So I'm just going to kind of retire and sit on the back and kind of keep out of things. Have you retired? Are you resentful or resistant to stepping up because it's too soon? Right? Have, have, has God done something in your family or in your life? And you say, I'm just not ready for this. And so you're fighting, taking on the responsibility of serving Christ as a young person or as a new believer. Right? Many of you, I, we, we've had this, old, Will, we've talked about this before. When you come to Christ, and if you come to Christ and you're the only person in that whole group of people, your life doesn't immediately get easier. It gets more complicated. Because now you're walking against the tide that you formerly used to swim with. And now the other people don't know what, how you fit in. You're not the same person. You're not fun anymore. You're not all those kind of things like that. And you're saying, I'm not ready for this. Well, no, you've been rescued. Now's the time to serve him. Maybe God has decided even while you're young to give you a burden, a thorn, Paul would call it, that you're saying, this is, this is not right. It's too young. And God says, no, no, I know what I'm doing. You need to trust me. Are you waiting until you grow up to get serious about following and serving Christ? Are you waiting till you grow up? If you're a follower of Christ, you need to follow Christ as soon as you're aware of what he calls you to do. And he wants you to talk to him. He wants you to read his word to you. He wants you to interact with the people in your life who love you in a way that respects their authority. It's never too young. Are you complaining that your part is too little? Right? So you're not serving God because he didn't give you the right gifts or he didn't give you the right partner or he didn't give you the right circumstances right? or he gave you a disability that you have to wrestle with. Are you excusing yourself from serving because you don't have the right credentials or you're not that smart or you don't have the training or, and you put it in there. For some people, well, God's not been fair to me and I'm just kind of going to withhold my service to him because life has been difficult. Over against the cross and the resurrection, truly, God has been so out of this world, gracious and generous with us. Anything that he asks us of never compares to what we've been given. So let me end with these words from our Ephesians study, right? To take us here. I'll take us back to something that's familiar. And I want you to see Here's Paul speaking to us from Ephesians chapter 2. I just want to read you this passage down through verse 10. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of the world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh, and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus in order that, right? So Christ raises us up, right, out of bondage, brings us alive, forgives us of our sins. And so what? So to do what? For the purpose that in the coming ages, he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. God's going to spend eternity loving us and bringing us to life. Verse 8, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast. Then verse 10, for we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. So the Christmas story and the actors in the Christmas story says that the director, the divine director, he's written a script that he's going to take the people who think it's too late and they're too old. He's going to take the people who think that they're too young and it's too early. And he's going to take the people 
who uh, seem like they don't have anything as far as the world concerns to, to offer, and they seem to be insignificant, and he's going to involve them in a drama that's a part of restoring and reclaiming everything. And he wants to bring them to life and use them to bring life to other people. So God, help us, right? Come out of retirement. Come out of retirement. Step in. If you're young, don't use the excuse of your youth that you got to wait till you grow up. Start following Jesus today. Right? And if you think that you're not significant, well, you need to look at the cross and realize that Christ died for you. That's pretty, pretty significant. And he wants to use you powerfully for him. Right? So God, give us that heart and mind as we think. Would you stand with me and let's pray together and you'll be dismissed today. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your mercies to us today. Lord, thank you for this sweet story. Lord, that is a true story uh, of a God who steps in and goes after rebels and people who had, had tossed you aside, who'd rejected, Lord, the way you had made us. And Lord, we were deserving Lord, of your punishment, your wrath. And Lord, you, uh, in your rich mercy, stepped in to rescue us. And Lord, this, this Christmas is, the, is a picture of the lengths to which you were willing to go. And Lord, we know that this is not even the fullest extent, Lord, not only that you became human, that you uh, submitted yourself to all the indignities of taking on human flesh, of even the life of a child, but Lord, this was just the beginning point of a descent that would culminate in death and even death on a cross. Oh God, we, we do not understand the height and width and length and breadth of your love for us. Lord, we often take it for granted. We think it's insufficient for the difficulties of our life. We think maybe it's too hard, it's too difficult, it's too much. Lord, forgive us for thinking so little of what you have given us. Lord, please, by your spirit, enable us. Lord, open the eyes of our hearts so that we might be rooted and grounded in your love. Lord, encourage us today, Lord, to live lives of purpose, to live lives of intention. Lord, renew our faith in you. Draw us close to you. God, give us a renewed vision for our lives, Lord, to love the people generously in our life, to represent you in every way we can. Lord, help us to step in. Help us to step up. Lord, help us to believe that our lives matter because you have made them matter. And so, Lord, we thank you in the name of Jesus, and we pray in his name and give thanks for him. Amen. God bless you. Have a good day.